Today on Building the Open Metaverse. Streaming from the cloud is just a GPU cost. Like basically, if you're booting up an app, a GPU on Amazon to stream anything, you're still paying for those GPU minutes. Um, if it's an offline render, you're paying for those GPU minutes in Octane Bench because it's a, it's a high latency job. But imagine that you could do the job in real time at 60 frames a second with just more GPUs. Like Octane scales, we have 100 or 1,000. We showed this in 2013. Like Jensen brought me on stage, made 100 GPUs, and it practically was real time. Um, now it only takes like five GPUs because this was 2013, right? But but the idea is that is that really, you know, the idea of render and the Octane bench score or the compute cost of a render is something that you could just add more power to get it to be in real time um, or simplify certain steps of the rendering process, but you're still paying for GPU to, you know, cost. Welcome to Building the Open Metaverse, where technology experts discuss how the community is building the open metaverse together. Hosted by Patrick Cozy from Cesium and Mark Petit from Epic Games. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our show, Building the Open Metaverse, the podcast where technologists share their insight on how the community is building the metaverse together. I'm here today, I'm Mark Petit, I'm with Patrick Cozy, my co my partner in crime for this podcast. Hello, Patrick. Hey, Mark, Hello. everybody. And today we have an intriguing guest, uh, somebody who's been in the industry uh, for a long time, has been funding one of the important CG companies uh, in the industry. Uh, our guest today is Joe Urbach, CEO founder of Otoy, and as well CEO founder of the Render Network, which we're going to discuss, and you're going to explain to us what the Render Network is. And so Jules, welcome to the show. We're super happy. We know you've been talking about the metaverse for a long time, so we were very, very looking forward to having you on the podcast. It's a pleasure being here, Mark and Patrick. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, it's it's great. Thank you. So maybe you know, start by introducing yourself and uh, how we usually describe you know describe your journey to the metaverse and why you're with us today. today. Uh, absolutely. Well, I, you know, my background. Uh, I mean, I've been in the business now since uh, 1993 when I did a my first CD-ROM game, Hellcab. This was in the days when you know CD-ROM was a new thing. So, I mean, I'm going almost on 30 years in the industry, and I, my passion um, has been both video games and films. And so Otoy, uh, you know, really came about. I mean, it was just me starting the company in my bedroom in my mom's house uh, 20 years ago. Um, but the vision of the company was, was to take some of the lessons I've learned from the video game world, my passion for CG and for films, and to kind of blend those together. And, uh, it, you know, and that's really how Otoy started, and that's something that was never really the destination either. It, it was all about building, you know, virtual worlds and a connected space, these mirror worlds that were, you know, kind of already in, in, in sort of the, um, uh, you know, pop culture in terms of, of people's minds of what they, you know, what they could look like. And for me, things like the internet and the web and social networks um, and video games and films to me are all just precursors to something that, that combines all of those. You know, you, you could imagine... Uh, you know, narrative elements that, that are holographically experienced, even if they're, they're, you know, intended to be told like a story that's been in books and movies before. Um, and games for me are, are something that, you know, again, I mean, you, you're starting to see that the interactive elements um, from, from all of these different mediums kind of converge. And I think the first, um, you know, two decades of my work at, at you know, starting and building Otoy was about figuring out how to get um, the quality of, of real-time rendering practically to the point where, you know, we could have one product that could do both films and, and, and games. And I think that's, a, that's something that, that's starting to really become possible with ray tracing hardware that's been introduced by first NVIDIA and now others. Uh, obviously, you know, with, with Unreal Engine, I'm, I'm a user. We have tons of artists that, in our company that use it. And, and um, you know, Otoy builds a software renderer, a GPU renderer called Octane that's integrated in every 3D tool um, for production, high-end rendering, but all these things are really about just democratizing the tool set. Um, and and you know a lot of what Otoy is best known for is Octane Render, mostly among motion graphics uh, artists that use it, like Beeple and Pack, um, you know, to create you know beautiful graphics that are um, that are rendered on the GPU. And you know we, we disrupted a lot of um, the thinking around offline rendering. Back in, in you know ten years ago, when we introduced Octane, uh, because we were able to go to full unbiased spectral rendering, you know, on people's laptops at forty times the speed of CPU rendering, and we still do that. Um, but I think that the the future of where this intersects with with the concept of the metaverse is that I do feel like like there's no point in trying to do less than than photorealistic rendering because there's going to be at least some 
portion of the world that wants to see a simulated virtual world that looks just like the real one, including people that make movies and CG. That's always been the holy grail is CG, you know, and anything you can throw in front of the camera and, and, and do in real time um, is obviously good enough for films, but also something that, that games have strived for as well. And where, where I think things have become very, very interesting is, is in the rise, frankly, of, of, of social networks and the crazy amounts of investment that, you know, since Oculus, I think, was acquired um, back in 2014 around the concept of building out experiences, right? And, 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 and there's, um, there's just been this through line where, you know, we're not even really seeing the beginning stages of true, real, um, you know, AR and VR adoption. I think that devices need to get smaller and more comfortable, but that might happen this year, next year, even, right? And then on, on the other side of things, we, you know, in the last 10 years, um, one of the things that's caught my attention separately from all these other pieces has been the blockchain. I mean, I, I was tracking, um, you know, Bitcoin back in, in 2010 and 11. Uh, I, I previously, even to that, was thinking about, the, you know, the, the hard problems to solve for rendering a, a mirror world or the metaverse, um, at, you know, whether it's real time or, or otherwise. And uh, compute cycles are, are something that's a resource, like like energy, like oil or electricity, literally, uh, it's power. And my concept back before uh, GPUs were a thing and in the cloud was to take, um, almost like Sadie at home, to take all this compute power from graphics cards that were out there and pay users per rate that was traced, like even if it were a penny. That was where the genesis for the render network really came from. It goes back almost to the beginning of O2. I was thinking about this even in 2004. And that was my plan B. My plan A was maybe Amazon or Microsoft or Google will put GPUs in the cloud and then cloud gaming and cloud rendering can happen. That sort of happened, but the costs and the capacity are still limited. And we're one of the largest, you know, uh, consumers of, of GPUs for uh, for clients that want to do offline rendering, real-time streaming. So the Render Network was was a project that, that kind of came into fruition or focus for me in the uh, you know, 2016, 2017 timeframe um, with the rise of Ethereum and the ability to sort of use uh, the value of, of both cryptocurrency tokens and the fact that GPUs were used to mine cryptocurrency, um, I figured, okay, well, this is the perfect time to reintroduce this concept from, you know, 13 years ago where people can get paid. And now they're used to getting paid for running their GPUs for some larger network. Um, and, and what we did is we just took the services that we were running, both the real-time uh, streaming service, which we've been running since 2014 or 15, um, streaming, Unreal, Unity, anything, right? We, we, you know, any kind of get, app or game that was a service that we built initially for Autodesk, um, and also offline rendering, uh, which we had done for our production rendering pipeline with Octane, and we transposed those um, to the render network. And we took the costs of what it would take to render uh, you know, in terms of GPU time for, for Ray, right, on, on Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, which are largely the same, you know, seven years later, and we pay out a cryptocurrency token um, as an ERC-20 you know, ERC token uh, to those miners. And what's amazing is that even at a fraction of the cost of what cloud rendering or computing is on, on AWS, um, we're able to, you know, to, to actually have this huge wait list. I mean, we have like 100,000 nodes in the wait list, and, and just enormous amounts of GPU power um, because as long as it's more expensive than electricity and pays out better than Ethereum uh, mining or any other cryptocurrency mining, uh, people want to make money. And a lot of uh, even our own customers have tons of extra GPU power that they've had on premise to do GPU rendering that they now are, are not even using. They're sending their, their render jobs to the render network. It, you know, we have hundreds of GPUs per customer practically, and you get back things in some cases. It could even be faster than real time if you were to imagine uh, having, you know, enormous amounts of, of, of uh, GPU power for every frame. Um, a two-hour real-time project, right, could still be divided into... Um, you know, into, into many thousands of, of, of frames that are done in, in, in parallel. So the parallelization of, of rendering is something that the render network is excellent at. And ultimately, I see that also just being a necessity for the size of certain assets or the ability to resolve, you know, virtual worlds or portals that, that just don't have the bandwidth or the, or the ability to render at every device in the planet. So that's kind of where, you know, the story of Otoy and render is, is taken us. And then when it comes to the metaverse, you know, that's a word that is that is very loaded. And I think, in, in, you know, I love I love the idea of it. I mean, obviously, like, canonically, it comes from, um, you know, Neil Stevenson, but, you know, going back to, what, 92. And everyone's sort of been thinking about having a, you know, a world you can plug into and experience. I think that that, that is something that is absolutely fundamentally in the future, 
you know, world line of humanity. Um, there's, there's, of course, many, you know, thoughts philosophically around, are we living in a simulated reality? Not even necessarily a computing, computable one, but if the laws of physics themselves are, are so precise and yet certain constants, like, aren't we, isn't this all sort of just potentially all code? And I do think that the metaverse just allows us to, to consider um, the d- digitization of almost everything that's, that's physically out there that hasn't been digitized. And, and, and that, you know, we, we've gone through so many forms of physical mediums and experiences and things that have been transcribed and digitized. I mean, you have knowledge, you now have, have communication and, and, and all these things. It's really sort of the last frontier of, of, of digitizing the physical world is you know, recreating the experience of being in the physical world and making that something that is a shared collective conscious experience. Um, and, and of course, when you imagine that as a, as a foundational baseline for many other types of services, including work and learning and, and entertainment and storytelling and games um, and, and, and possibly even research and exploration, um, that's that to me is the potential promise of the metaverse at, a, at just an art, creative, artistic and you know, uh, humanist level. Uh, I do think that that what's happened since you know Facebook changed its, Facebook changed its name to Meta is that uh, you know we've seen this. There, there's a gold rush to to just putting anything that you can with connected to this label, and I think that's a bit sad because not everything is is the metaverse, and not everything that said, says they're in the metaverse is really in it yet. Um, we're, we're still at the protocol level in my mind of what the metaverse needs to be. And so, so saying something's in the metaverse is a bit tricky. It's like saying, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a bit early. Um, if I were to sort of gauge where things were at, uh, I would say that, you know, before we had the internet and the web, right. We, you know, we, we had DARPA, we had, uh, you know, before there was a, you know, the browser, you had TCP IP and you had UDP, you had protocols that just transferred data. Um, then you had things like, you know, the web, which was something that really did transform society and, and open the door to the tr- multi-trillion dollar companies that we see today. You know, Google and Amazon and Facebook, even Apple, I think, owe a lot of their early growth to the fact that, you know, you did have Safari on, on the iPhone, one, that, there's no app store. That was how you would see uh, ex- you know, and experience things. And I, I lament the fact that since, you know, the appification you know, or the app store was launched and since we've had, um, you know, even in some ways the walling off of, of the open web into uh, social media verticals, we've lost a lot. And, and my hope is, uh, and it's shared by one, one of my, you know, mentors and advisors to both Otway and Render, Brendan Ike, who created JavaScript. He, uh, when he was in Escape, he also created Mozilla and Firefox and went on to create the Brave browser as a basic attention token. You know, if he was telling me that if you'd only put a buy button in, in Mozilla's Firefox thing, it might have totally changed the world. You might not have had the App Store model evolve. You could have, the open web could have actually become something um, that, that, that would have been a platform. And they were working on the Mozilla phone. Uh, Andres Gal, who's now at Apple, who's the CTO of Mozilla, was developing essentially what you have now in the browser where you can provide, you know, the, the camera and the microphone services per web page, per site, progressive web apps. And all of those things combined would have been a, a, an amazing open frontier for, um, you know, f- for development. And now you, you have, you know, a duopoly of app stores. You have sort of this limited, um, you know, set of things you can do within those frameworks. And I hope that doesn't happen for the metaverse. So when when somebody's, you know, and, and, I, and I know I've been sort of t- talking everyone's ear off to this point, but, I, but it's such a, a, a big part of sort of why I want open standards is I do feel like as a creator developer, I've always wanted my software, my art, to go everywhere, to not worry about it being limited, to not have the, you know, ability of it to not be shared. And I, and I think that I've seen a lot of, I mean, starting, right, I mean, obviously everyone's aware of the fact that, you know, Microsoft in the 90s was a bad actor, right? I mean, Internet Explorer, I mean, I, my previous computer toy was just building ActiveX controls to build games and browsers, and there really wasn't anything, I mean, it was whatever Microsoft said the web was, was what we got. And the reason why I really respect Brendan is that when, when he went and, and did Firefox and Mozilla, and, and flip that whole script around. I mean, we all are using maybe you know Chrome or Safari now, but the the you know that was something that really did transform the world. And I think the metaverse needs that Mozilla model. Like that's what I hope the metaverse is. And I do think that that's where we want to take it. So on that note, I, I think that sort of describes a bit of my journey to to the open metaverse. Yeah. Thanks for going straight to the heart of the matter. I mean, that's that's good. So how do you make you know, how do you make the Mozilla model happen in the metaverse? You have some. Some ideas, lectures. How do you make the Mozilla model, you know, a reality for the metaverse? You know, how we collectively in an industry, what, what do we need to do? 
Well, the first thing is don't let um, the equivalent of Microsoft, you know, cordon off 51% of it. That would be bad because that's the first thing is, is I think that, that it's the danger is simply that somebody gets so much traction in the space that it doesn't even matter what anyone else does. And that's, that's always a problem. So I think we're lucky in the sense that there's multiple trillion dollar companies that want to play in the space that probably won't let other multi-trillion dollar companies have that 51% ownership of it. But it, it doesn't really help either if you have a duopoly or, or something along those lines, because there is, there is this is a much more complicated system than, than anything that preceded it. This is much, in some ways, if you look back at the Mozilla model, um, you know, you did, it's, it's a 2D document model. I mean, the document model has been around since, since the Gutenberg printing press or before, right? I mean, this is something that the, the metaverse is very different. It's spatial. Obviously, I think people just largely agree that in a lot of respects, it's built on a foundation where, it, you know, space and time and spatial rendering and all these things are just fundamentally a part of it as much as data is. And so when you talk about building something in the metaverse, and having that same thing operate in somebody else's part of the metaverse, then things like open standards and interoperability um, really do matter. And of course, if you have anything that's commercially locking in somebody into one app payment system or the rules for that payment system, I mean, that becomes complex. So one of the best, you know, uh, disinfectants, I think, to, 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 to a, a closed vertical centralized metaverse is decentralization, is crypto. And that's why I'm such a huge proponent of it. I think the payments alone are largely, in some ways, solved. Because if you if you look at cryptocurrency, and there's going to be many, many, many different you know altcoins beyond Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and, the, and the big ones even like Solana, right? That we're working, we're partnering with them too. Um, the idea of, of, of sort of paying in a, in a format or in a way that, that provides value outside of even money now is a thing. That's amazing. Um, and and you have storage that's decentralized. So you have ARWE, you have IPFS, you have things like that. Where, where you know we're, we're getting to the point where sort and fundamental things don't have to be on a public cloud or on a website. And, 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 it's, and, and that's sort of where even render comes in, right? If we can decentralize and democratize computing resources, uh, storage, um, all those things, and, and we have payments kind of covered, then, then, when it, you know, then I think at a foundational level, like, like we have some of the things sorted out that were never sorted out in the app store or web model at all. Like, I mean, payments are still kind of, you know, a, a bit tricky. Um, whereas when you go and you, and you, you know, let's say buy an NFT, typically you could do it with a crypto wallet. There's still probably a lot of work to be done to make that process a lot simpler and easier. But I think it will happen. And I think that the open standards part is absolutely fundamental. So I, you know, I know Patrick, of course, we're on the, on the 3D formats working group, working in GLTF. I've been part of that, I think, since 2016 or maybe earlier. And I, I love GLTF um, because it, it is literally the JPEG of, of 3D, you know. And, and of course, the, the, the web was, was images on the web were JPEGs, maybe PNGs later. Um, but that's still largely the case. So when you're talking about something that's replicating um, the success or the value proposition of, of the open web, you need open standards for at the very least 3D models. Um, and there's a number of different, you know, ways you can look at that because even when you had and still have JPEGs, right? You still have Photoshop files. You have, to, you know, what, what goes into making that JPEG. And that's where I think the metaverse is a bit different than, than preceding platform ecosystems or even mediums in that, you know, one of the things that I'm a big proponent of is I think every, you know, iteration of an asset or an item is in some ways almost like equally valuable in, in, in the metaverse because you do want to have something that is almost like a, a, a JPEG to, to sort of view it or to have an iconic representation of an asset. But you also want to know essentially you know, like to the maximum level of its quiescent reality, how it's how that object or that asset was created, even how to render it. And that's where render comes in. And, and for render to work, um, you know, we, you know, even as a service, as a, as a product for all of our customers, right? And we make plugins for 26 different 3D tools. I mean, even, even After Effects, which is not necessarily a 3D tool, has, has a plugin. Um, you know, we needed to come up with a way where we could take everything that was in the authoring environment and save that into a format that we can then upload to the cloud or now, you know, the decentralized blockchain um, and not have After Effects and not have 3D engines or, or anything other than just the data and then render it with, with just a standalone tool. And since then, we've also added other renderers like Arnold and Redshift and, and even any hyper render delegate, um, you know, Unreal and Unity, all those things. So, so the concept of having an, a format for the absolute, like the almost raw format or the, or the you know, the, the archive format um, is really important. And, and we almost accidentally stumbled into such a, uh, you know, such a format when we created Orbex. 
uh, which was I think back in like in 2012 or 13 or something. And it was really a, a, a virtual disk so that we could put anything in it. Um, and everything that was in sort of the render state of any of these 3D applications, so every time a third party would add a plugin, if we did a Unity integration, which we did, or an Unreal plugin, you could take everything in Unreal or Unity or, or anything, and it would save it as an Olympic file or an FBX or an OBJ. Those are the three mesh formats, EXRs, PNGs, and a bunch of XML with all the materials in a format that was suitable for Octane, but that itself was basically based on, on Matt Farr's book on rendering, right? The laws of physics and light. So we had something that for me felt like, well, this is an asset that would, you could feed into the Star Trek holodeck for rendering. That was the goal. And Octane was, was in some ways the, the, the product to render that. Um, but, but the metaverse can't be a product or a company or anything else. Um, but because we'd already picked as an export target for Orbex open formats and, you know, the wraparound, it was pretty trivial. Um, you know, we started to get interest from, from groups like MPEG um, and JPEG, you know, back, back in the um, mid last decade. And I joined MPEG and JPEG just to see if we could take Orbex and turn that into something that was an industry wide spec and i think it was so early that when i was explaining this is a scene graph of the metaverse this is something where if you have a holographic display panel which you know partners like like the lab are building this is what you would need because the star trek holodeck is actually like a, a, a you know a goal that i want to see achieved and i want to have a format that can support it and even for archiving i want data and graphics and things to last decades um orbex files created 10 years ago still rendered just fine today and now they can render into the renders that didn't even exist when we you know launched octane so this is where orbex came about as a spec and it is a fairly heavy spec i mean it's meant to be you know elite because a heavy um, graphics file format and it's evolved because it's essentially a scene graph and you can replace geometry with anything. That's, you know, we added GLTF once it, GLTF was, was created because it is an efficient way of storing models. We have multiple different image formats, but ultimately they're transposable. And we've even done things where you can take an Orbex file and turn it into a GLTF, turn it into a USD, or take GLTF and USD files and put them inside of an Orbex and they both work. And we have a, a you know, that system is, is designed to be an umbrella so that we can catch every important piece of the authoring pipeline, at least for rendering, and have that as a renderable format. Um, and so, so Orbex, when we initially introduced some of these ideas to the GLTF working group, I think the mandate then for GLTF was, you know, this needs to be really small and run on mobile devices. And, and that was, that is still correct. Like you want to have something that's really fast to transmit and load. And I was so impressed really with that mindset that I was like, well, we should adopt GLTF inside of Orbex because it's so fast to load. It's so efficient. This is great. Like we want that as, as an option, right? And what's happening, I guess, now with, as, as GLTF is, is sort of evolving is in, into things where people use it for 3D commerce. People are looking at it. Frankly, a lot of 3D NFTs our GLTF files was dropped into, um, you know, in, you know, into a web page, right? So, you know, I just tweeted about that this morning. What we want to do initially is just make it so that an Orbex file that's used to render or create or even export that GLTF, and we can export and distill things down into it into a GLTF. Well, well, that has on chain, you know, the full scene graph, and you could render the high fidelity holographic version of it. And in some ways, from my perspective, that means that a GLTF is that asset because, in, in, you know, when you look at how render works, it's it's not storing it necessarily on an S3 bucket. All the textures, all the 3D models are shuffled to 256 caches, already ready to be looked up on IPFS or AR weave on the blockchain. We have an XML graph, which we can, you know, pretty easily turn into JSON that just gives you instructions like an HTML page of how this asset goes together. And what we do need is, is a, you know, is sort of a, a link or, you know, a link in the metaverse, right, that can link to that. And my thinking is instead of having a text, you know, URL, you have a GLTF file that has some sort of blockchain reference to the, to the deeper asset or a portal to it, um, because we do need something like that. And that's kind of what we're experimenting with. So it, it's kind of like by adding a met, bit, bit of metadata into a GLTF and dropping that in any, you know, thing that can consume a GLTF, any web page, any marketplace, um, you have sort of the instructions, like the Voyager Golden Record of like the DNA for how this thing, what it means, what it's supposed to do. And the work that we've been doing with Render, where we are rendering production renders on the blockchain, um, it's also, I mean, many NFTs are done on Render, and instead of giving people an, uh, an image, you know, at the end of that, right, which is what a lot of NFTs are, 
the whole render job, the whole graph itself really is already an NFT in the sense that it's, it's you know, the whole way that render works is we have a proof of render system. If the render successfully completes, whether it's in real time or whether it takes 10 hours, um, that's when the token exchange happens. That's where your, you know, the compute resources used are paid out to the, um, you know, to the person that provided it and the artist or creator or consumer of the asset gets what they want. And that to me is also a fundamental part of the metaverse because having something that, that proves what something is and who created it and how to recreate it and how it can be remixed um, and how those things could possibly interoperate is fundamental. And I think from a visual high quality rendering perspective and possibly real time, um, it, we're kind of there, but what's kind of missing is, well, what, what is the royalty stream for this thing and what are the physics and how does the interactivity work? And th this is where things get, get much more complicated uh, because I think that, that you know, we're just starting to sort of see now inside of the USD spec, for example, um, Apple and NVIDIA typically don't really agree on a lot of standards together. But in this case, they, they both you know, settled on this physics, rigid body physics uh, schema for USD. That's really good. I mean, that basically is like, you know, we were thinking if in, inside of, you know, Orbex, which is also now um, open source through a cable as is ITMF, let's add that schema. We support USD, right? So anything that USD has technically is inside of our larger framework. But this kind of standardization, even between things that are inside of GLTF, Material X, USD, for, you know, for, for materials, for shaders, for physics, I mean, it's important because you don't want to have 20 different versions of it. Um, and I think that that work is kind of, you know, it's kind of happening. And I think that, that we're going to probably see some interesting um, convergence happening around Material X. I think that the fact that that's now an Academy Software Foundation project is really good. There is a Material X to MDL to OSL and GLSL backend, right? So even if you're looking at one of those three as your, you know, shader, shader spec of choice, you have, you have options there. Um, we've also, when we added other renders to the render service, other than Octane, like we also gave something back. We adopted Arnold Standard Surface, which our, you know, the Autodesk team was trying to get out there as a, as a spec. Do you think it was better than the one we had in, in Octane? So that went into both ITMF and everything we're doing as well. And and it's it's great. I mean, we are now much closer to having it so that if you pop up an Arnold or, or an Octane render, they will look the same with the same materials. And we're working with Maxon to doing the same with Redshift. Um, and I think that's going to all sort of become a learning experience for us to really converge on at least for the highest possible quality, how this all works. Um, for Unreal and Unity, I mean, Unity, we had this integration um, that was kind of bespoke for, for that for in, back in 2017. Um, and in Unreal, we launched that in 2019, where we can take an Orbex file and we can convert it to Unreal meshes, materials, shaders, HLSL is crazy, and, and back and forth. So we kind of are bringing all the benefits of all the open source pieces we've done, and we can transpose those into other formats. That's also that transposability is fundamental to how the metaverse needs to work. It shouldn't just be a format that is rigid. It should be the fact that that format is actually transposable into other formats that might have better, you know, utility for real time or for other purposes, or that hide or, 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 or remove some data so that it can't be repurposed. But those are the kinds of things that, that start to make this very different. And and even when you think about apps or games that are published with multiple, you know, backends for, oh, this is for mobile, this is for web, this is for desktop, this is for console, this is for VR. You know, what I think the metaverse truly really needs is the meta version of the asset that, that basically allows a, a, you know, a single sort of through line of, 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 of you know, virtual space and, and, and gameplay or whatever else you want to encompass to be rendered in these different modalities, you know, by creating it once and by having the system itself sort of help with these pieces. Um, and ultimately, you know, whether or not the world is going to be rendered in two shading or, or completely you know, similar to the world we live in with photorealistic, you know, lighting and rendering, um, the idea of assets themselves kind of being, you know, certainly from the author and the creative perspective, defined first and then having those pieces added is really another fundamental piece. And that's why O2A's and company, for me, our role is for artists, not necessarily the tools or the software, the product or the service. It's we are here to serve artists so that their creations you know, basically, you know, can, can, can continue and exist and interact um, in all the ways the metaverse will allow. Um, and so these are just conceptually the things that are in my head every day as I'm thinking about all these pieces, you know, coming together. So Jules, I, I love the philosophy. I love the vision. I love your passion for this. I mean, do you have a, a call to action, especially around the open standards? Like what should we as a community, you know, what's the next step? What's the next experimentation, what what should we be doing? I think that, that, you know, it would be amazing if you had multiple 
I mean, you know, listen, as a company, obviously I make a rendering product that I sell. So having other renders on the service that we also created is it was it surprised a lot of people. I think it would be amazing if you could, for example, get get get, get some sort of um, convergence between like GLTF and you. So like, we're doing that in ITML. ITMF exists or WorkX exists to really smooth out those differences. But I do think that, you know, if you could have protocols that could allow whether something's in USD or, or GLTF format or any other format to kind of exist in a scene graph that is so obvious in, its, in how it's represented that no one argues with it. I mean, that's kind of where an HTML page kind of exists, right? Um, you know, you can go to a web page and at the very least you'll, you'll have a body and, and a header and a, and a fave icon and things like that. I mean, some sort of high level framework for any sort of 3D spec or future specs or future, future iterations is important. I mean, that's philosophically where the ITMF, not the full package part, but just the graph of it, the equivalent of HTML is something that should just be a JSON graph or table. Like that's that's fundamental. And then you want to have at the very least the blockchain, you know, the, the blockchains themselves, no matter which chain you're using, no matter what marketplace it's on, you have some way of, of tagging the, the commerce aspects because obviously making money and selling things and NFTs is already a really important piece of that. Um, and, and I think those are some of the fundamental pieces that, you know, like you, you attach that to really healthy standards that are already strong, like USB and, and like VLTF and anything we can add. Like, I don't care if ITMF or Orbex ever gets adopted. I just want a, you know, I just want those features to be available broadly in whatever the metaverse becomes. So in some sense, you know, as long as the framework that, that everyone's sort of going after is kind of defined and like, well, whatever, you know, we have in a web page, whether it's a JPEG, a PNG, WebP, or some other thing, um, the image element is defined, the HTML body is defined, and there's maybe some system where, you know, Rust code on the GPU can actually, you know, be its own render or formats themselves can be self-describing or procedural through a system that is the equivalent of, like, WebAssembly or JavaScript. Potentially, you know, that to me feels like that framework should be a priority. And, and the entire industry needs to like agree that that's an important piece. Um, my concern is that if, if you if you have the mindset of like, well, if it's not on my device or it's not in, you know, with my sign in, something is you know, fundamentally can't be taken out of my bubble, um, you know, from a, like I created it, I put it in this, I, I created it in this bubble and taking it out of it, that doesn't feel right to me. Like you need to have the equivalent of identity interoperability, asset interoperability, not just at a, at a you know, technology or data level, but at a, like, this can leave, I can, I can take this elsewhere. Um, you know, some of this has actually kind of happened where, with Disney doing the movies anywhere thing. You buy something on iTunes or Google Play, you kind of own the movie and you can watch it on the other one. Not perfect, but that should be like a fundamental thing of, of you know, ownership and art and things that are happening in one section of the metaverse, no matter what it is, you know, the, the actual asset or idea itself is transposable. And that's where we've seen all these mistakes happen, where if your identity is locked into one social network or your data is for that matter, or your how that data is used, it's not great. So I do feel like that's where, where you know, ha having those things clearly defined early on um, and, and ensuring that nobody's trying to put those in place and lock, you know, lock the rest of the industry out from doing something about it, I think is, is pretty important. So, yeah, I mean, that's how I see some of the important, like, red flags of, of, of you know, early metaverse uh, adoption, you know, needing to be really well thought out, really well thought out. Can you highlight for us the um, what you did with ITMF? I think it's, you know, you, you made some interesting in, in, inference and it's about, you know, being a super format and scene representation, I think it would be interesting to dig a little bit in there. Yeah, so ITMF literally came out of this Darwinian evolution of having to support every 3D tool because it wasn't just us making integrations for Octane. It was every third party that came to us and said, hey, we'd like to license uh, and create a plugin for in Autodesk Inventor and SketchUp. I mean, that's how we got to like practically 30 tools, and this has been the case forever. So we wanted a way... I mean, o 2 has always been a cloud-centric company. Cloud has always been an important vision. I had the idea for distributed rendering for a while. And I knew for a fact that, like, if I'm rendering on a Linux machine, and C40, for example, didn't have C40 for Linux, right? So I needed a way to take out everything from a 3D tool and, you know, and export it. And I and I figured I could have done this in a proprietary format, right? Or, as it turned out, like, Alembic was just useful enough at the time to be a, a pretty good target for animation, right? I mean, now you lose things in Alembic. You don't have skeletal deformations. USD adds that. So but inside of, of, of ITMF, ITMF is the open source version of Orbex. Like Orbex is, Otoy created it. It's it's there. It's very much like Apple created, you know, QuickTime, the MOV format, and then gave that to MPEG. And MP4 and MOV are 
practically the same, but MP4 is the MPEG, you know, industry adopted version of that. And ITMF is the equivalent relative to Orbex. I mean, right now they're pretty much identical. We're helping to to keep the ITMF going. We've got other, um, you know, partners in, in IDEA. Um, and, and IDEA is very focused on this sort of master level, you know, like we're going for the holodeck, right? That's what the mandate for that working group was. But I do see the fact that GLTF and USB are both sub assets in this thing is important. And also, you know, right now within the GLTF working group, you know, we're proposing, let's just take the, the graph part of, of ITMF and let's at least see what parts of that can make sense in, in inside of a GLTF file or even in a USD. Like there's nothing wrong with, with these things going into other formats. And similarly, in some ways, because of that, things that are added in USD, like the physics system and they have an audio thing in USD, right? These are elements that, that were sort of like, well, this goes into ITMF and this could also then go back into a GLTF. So I, ITMF really is something that there, I don't know of any other format that's out there that allows you to take your, your art, which is what I cared about when, when this sort of was created, and render it without the DCC with everything there. There's no plugins. You don't need to worry about what the DCC was, what the plugins are. And the last step was we need to get rid of our own renderer and make it so that you can load in any renderer and render an ITMF file. And we now have at least three. You know, we've got Mars, Venus, and, and, and Earth, like, in the sense of, of you know, Redshift, Arnold, and Octane are all kind of able to transpose these. We're adding cycles, first open source, full renderer, and, and it's all operating also as, with any Hydra render delegate. So we did this crazy thing where we can turn an Orbex or an ITMF into a USD scene delegate, not a render delegate, and then any render delegate can connect to that. And it's really interesting. So by doing so, we've, we've, we've sort of blown open all these weird you know, doors, and we even have a streaming spec where you can take one endpoint that's that's generating an ITMF or stream and send it to another and mix those together. So we could cross the streams. We could have Unreal and Unity both running and then both mixing those scenes together in a, in, a, in either you know thing. And and that is a bit what Omniverse is doing as well with the connector system. And I love the Omniverse team and I know Richard Karras really well. And obviously USD is a big part of that pipeline. Um, and so we're connect we're building you know connectors to Omniverse. But if you think about the larger metaverse, I mean you need something that that runs you know, potentially not on NVIDIA hardware. You know, the thing is that the the, the three renders, like I, I guess, you know, the, the, the two uh, renders that are non-universe are render delegates, but they don't run on anything but NVIDIA cards, I think. Um, and also there is no real, like, Mac client, right, for, for Omniverse. And, and you know, and, and more importantly, I'm thinking, like, that's, that's not the really, that's not the real deal breaker. We just need something larger that kind of smooths out those edges. So if you wanted to stick to that, you know, that, that system, it still works in the larger metaverse. The data can go out of it, into it. It's not locked into Omniverse or ITMF, whatever. So ITMF is ultimately, I just gave that to Cable Labs, and there's no royalties, no nothing. All the IP is, is tier one. It's, it's I couldn't do that in MPEG, by the way. That's one of the reasons why I stopped focusing on on doing this through MPEG and Cable Labs, which, you know, had basically um, you know, been a big part of the MPEG working group, uh, helped to start IDEA with people that were like-minded. And and all of that to me is just knowledge to be donated to the rest of anyone else interested in open metaverse. So, you know, you can take pieces or get ideas in ITMF and you can put them in other things. But ultimately, like, as I'm part of other, you know, consortiums and, and working groups like GLTF, I'm thinking like a JSON profile of ITMF inside of GLTF could be super useful. And that's exactly the kind of, like, like thinking that I think will lead to, a, a you know, an open metaverse spec. Um, but maybe ITMF alone, it's simple enough. It's, 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 it's already mostly an umbrella format in JSON or XML wrapping around other things. That, and, and it's always changing with other parts of the industry. Like, if you think about how, you know, OSL, USD, EXR, GLTF in themselves evolve, they are evolving the ITMF format in, in themselves, right? So it's a very intriguing option. And I think... Because of the fact that we have this this amazing opportunity at the ground floor with the Solana team, like their their recent blockchain, they're basically the number five blockchain by market cap, and we we are on Ethereum and NFTs are mostly on Ethereum, but Solana is much faster transaction volumes. There is a bridge that goes back to Ethereum, so you don't lose any continuity there. And as I'm thinking of storing things on chain for real time scene graph changes, like I need something faster. And we looked at Algorand, we looked at everything else. Uh, the Solana framework seems really intriguing. It, you know, you can t use credit card payments on Solana, which is really important for crypto users that don't know crypto that well yet. And they're also starting a whole um, NFT spec that is just very open. So they're like, what, what do you guys want and what can we do to help? And I'm thinking, well, let's let's get GLTF with the ITMF 
extras in, in there because they already have on Metaplex, which is their baseline equivalent of the ERC-721 NFT, the ability to drop in its GLTF file. Um, I just want to extend that to streamable portals and, and full scene graphs. And I think that if we can prove that on Solana and we can prove it with the GLTF and the ITMF pieces in there and add all, this, all those elements in the next few months, well, then we've got a proof of concept where other chains and other, I mean, you know, we can at least start figuring out what went wrong or right with that and then use that as a pretty good starting point for, for a larger, you know, real industry standard. And I love that. I mean, that's why this year is so exciting. Super exciting. Yeah, now look, uh, I heard you talk about Solana and starting to mix real time and chain in the same sentences, and that was kind of starting to raise my, scary, my right? interest. Yeah, and so, but I think ex explain to us a little bit more like, because, you know, okay, render network as a way to, like, you know, delegate offline rendering, but you're starting to, to use sentences like, you know, you render on the chain or the data is on the render network. And so you seem to imply render on demand, even all the way to, you know, real-time rendering and interactive content on the render network. So is, is you know, is your implementation of the networks going all the way there? Yes. Um, and I think that, that the way that, here's an interesting thing is if you look at um, the two primary real-time engines are Unity and Unreal, which, you know, we've had a strong and long and deep relationship with, with, with both both of them, right? And, and with that people as well. And we've done so many crazy things. We've been doing streaming um, and cloud gaming since before Gaikai and Online. Like, we were doing this in, in 2006 and, and 7 and 8. So, for me, streaming from the cloud is, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, we, 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 we just switched from cloud gaming to doing, you know, Audience is our largest investor, uh, early investor, and, and they, they invested in us so that, you know, because OnLive, I guess, was at, at some point doing their app streaming, and then we just did their app streaming, and it worked great. That's how we got to know um, Mozilla and, and Amazon, and, and we helped launch the G2 instance in 2013 with all of them. So for me, streaming from the cloud is just a GPU cost. Like, basically, if you're booting up an app, a GPU on Amazon to stream anything, you're still paying for those GPU minutes. Um, if it's an offline render, you're paying for those GPU minutes in Octane Bench because it's a, it's a high latency job. But imagine that you could do the job in real time at 60 frames a second with just more GPUs. Like Octane scales, we have 100 or 1,000. We showed this in 2013. Like Jensen brought me on stage, we had 100 GPUs, and it practically was real time. Um, now it only takes like five GPUs because this was 2013, right? But but the idea is that is that really, you know, the idea of render and the Octane Bench score or the compute cost of a render is something that you could just add more power to get it to be in real time um, or simplify certain steps of the rendering process, but you're still paying for GPU, you know, cost somewhere, right? And that doesn't go away if you're, if you're doing anything other than local rendering. Now, maybe one GPU locally is all you might need to render everything, but what if the asset itself is 100 gigabytes and then you have to deal with the download cost? And what if 100 gigabytes need to be touched by a thousand other people? Maybe it needs to be stored somewhere else. So the way that I, I see it is we're starting, we're doing this in the, in the right order. Right? Like I wanted to get offline rendering to work well, that's never going away because it, as much as you think real-time rendering has solved the problem at 4K or 8K, well, now here come holographic displays. That's, you know, basically, you know, 10 gigapixels per square meter and you need 16 GPUs per foot to just power the panel, to, to display it. 16 a 6000 by the way. So it's insane, like the power consumption. So we're not done with offline at all. Like that's pre-computed rendering for those types of devices for high resolution displays are always a thing. There's always a higher quality maybe one day real time, but, in the, but, but it's a spectrum. And so as we look at, at how NFTs are evolving, like there are people that have minted and created NFTs because on render, they can render 5,000 versions of the same image, right, with different, slightly different materials. It's a beautiful output, and render does that really easily. The, the way towards real time, though, is um, essentially, you know, getting back the job instantly is real time. So in other words, if you have your scene, and what we do is we, we atomize the whole thing. It's not an Orbex when it's on the render network, it's atomized into a SHA-256 hash for every single file. We don't know the file name anymore. We just know if it's uniquely been uploaded. And that's exactly how distributed file storage on the blockchain works. It also maps back to S3. So we just have the literal, the, the, you know, the information theory hash of, of a model or a texture. And then we have a graph, including all the deltas, all the changes, right, um, as you recompose it and rebuild it. So, you know, if Beeple wants to, to rebuild his NFTs that he sold at render the for resolution, like we can do that on render. We've got all these things on there. And now we have the ability, I mean, with Epic, right, 4.27 has the ability to take the entire Unreal Engine and put that into a module that's open source. We license Cinema 4D, St. Blender is open. So we don't need to actually even export to Orbex. We can put the source files there. 
and those become one option. And ultimately, what we want to be able to do is give you the option of saying, I want an offline render. And some of those things have to happen because it's not a real-time thing at all. It's just like this needs to go on a holographic display or this needs to be a piece of art that is fixed and, and, and that's it. Or I want the same thing in real time and I'm willing to, to lose the quality because we have Brigade and we even have, like, we can transpose and item it into Unreal or Unity or any other Hydra rendered elegant and give you back a live stream. And in order to pay for that on the render network, we will pay you premium if you just keep your GPU running, just ready for a live stream at any moment. Because a lot of how render works is that, you know, if you're using your GPU, it's not available on render. But if it's, you know, in order to be ready for live streaming, you need to have that availability. But we have such a diffused number of, of nodes all over the world that even the latency becomes much simpler than traditional cloud gaming or traditional data centers. Because we have, like, the first week of render, we have 1,200 different nodes all over the, the map with an average of 10 10, 1080 TIs each, right? Which gives us massive amounts of power, but also massive amounts of distribution. So we probably can get to endpoints or the edge pretty easily with streaming on render. And we're just going to make it so that instead of just uploading art, you can now upload, at least from Unreal and Unity, and maybe what we're doing with the GLTF or, or USD physics, just something that is viewable and, and it's not meant to be, you know, any specific thing. I mean, it's meant to be this, this, this large, larger framework for just giving you the ability to do real-time computing and offline computing with the same service. And you're still paying for compute cycles either way, uh, probably in some ways even ray tracing cycles when you even as real-time evolves towards real-time ray tracing. So Jules, what about network bandwidth for real-time, say for mobile? Is 5G enough or how far does network bandwidth need to go? It's fine right now, frankly, for anything that isn't AR or that's called XR, right? You know, because I think that, that and even there, it's it's really, it's, it's interesting because you have NVIDIA's entire cloud XR stack, which is, you know, a, a method that I think works pretty well, which is you already have, if you're talking about AR and VR in particular, you already have positional time warping, you know, that, that was largely pushed forward by the Oculus team and, and Karmic and others, where it takes a depth buffer and it reprojects it. So you have fluid motion, even if the render locally is too slow. So in some sense, latency, if you have positional time warping, is really well handled. Um, state information for how that world is rendered is no different than if you're playing on a server where the lo render is local, but the world's information is coming in from the cloud. So I, I think that 5G is fine. I think it's fine for everything um, up into super high, you know, 4K or 8K displays that might be in each eye. But I think that in some ways, you know, AR and VR rendering, because you're, you're obviously going to be streaming the depth buffer and all those other things, it could work. The, the tricky part is when you have mixed reality and you have the world locally being mixed with, the, with, with something that's a cloud stream. And we've been playing with that too. It's not impossible, but you're just basically then doing a bi-directional, you know, scan or stream of the world. And, and I think that, that, you know, we're at a point now where even Octane runs just fine in iPhone 11. Like it's not super fast, but it is faster than the GPUs that were on Amazon in the G2 instances in 2013, right? Which is crazy. That was the initial cloud gaming. You know, the K520s, the great K520s are now slower than an iPhone 11 and Octane runs on both. So we're at a point where, yes, we can render things locally and, and, and beautifully, but I do think that having the ability to sort of scan the environment, put that into the, into the device and also send that to the cloud and, and coordinate those things, I think that can happen over 5G. I mean, when you look at what 6G is trying to do, it's like that's where you're, you're just getting into like, you know, the, the ability to have shared, you know, GPU memory or something equivalent to that over 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 the um, over everything. Now, there is a case for that with holographic display panels and things that are going into the, you know, 10, you know, in, into the gigapixel resolution, um, which will be video walls of the future. And possibly, you know, every 100 inch TV in a home in, in the 2030s will be, you know, at that resolution of 4000 DPI and, and all this stuff. And that's where cable labs was looking for ITMF to help provide a standard so they could justify 100 gigabit fiber to the home and potentially 6G would have the same requirements. But for, I think the glasses and devices we have today, 5G is pretty good. It's really good. If you have the coverage, obviously you have spotty coverage, not so great. So I want to double click on something else. I mean, on top of uh, everything you described about the flat rendering, uh, Otto is involved in, in light field rendering, you know, and pioneering all that space, you know. So can, can you... Can you speak to that and when can we, I mean, you kind of touch base on the amount of compute that's necessary uh, to, to make light field rendering a reality, but what's your, how do, how do we think about light field rendering? So I think of it very much, you know, and I think a lot of, 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 of this defi is defined really by the endpoint, right? So when, when, you know, Oculus was a thing and the iPhone became a thing, everything changed around that, right? In the sense of like, you know, you started to have a, the idea of a VR platform or a mobile platform. So for me, life fields were, were it, it's like, you know, there's so many different things, ways you can look at it. I look at it very much as like, well, 
I want the Star Trek holodeck. That is the ultimate endpoint for for you know mixed reality or experiences. I don't like wearing glasses. I mean, you know, I, I don't think most people like wearing even simple polarized. Um, glasses, because otherwise 3D TVs would be a thing, right? So you know for a fact that nobody wants to wear anything if they can avoid it. And just thinking through that, 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 that to the end point, like the holodeck is, you know, those that aren't Star Trek fans or know about it, it's a, it's a room on the Starship Enterprise that you go into and it creates any environment for you. It's a small room. It's not infinitely large, but it feels like you're there and you can interact with it. And it's, it even has this kind of treadmill effect where you can keep walking, right? And you think you're always in this, this infinitely large simulated reality. Those devices... You know, it's funny with Star Trek because some of these things that are hundreds of years out happened in, in 10 years. Like Picard had this thing, you know, this, this iPad, right, that was so advanced in the 90s. And then 2011, Steve Jobs rolls out the iPad. We're, we're at the point in some ways with, with, with holographic display panels. Those, to me, are the – every time that I was thinking about light fields, the last 20 years, I was thinking about at some point the resolution will get so good – that you will be able to replicate a hologram. And a hologram, digital or, or whether it's on film, right, is still basically creating, you know, essentially for every tiny point, it's creating a, a light field that, that you see and that feels like you're looking at something real. When you look out of a window, um, there's a barrier between you and, and, and the rest of the world. But the reason why you experience reality on the other side of the window is there's a light field propagating through the glass. And if that glass was an emissive display and you could replace a window with a light field panel, you might not care what view you have in your apartment. You might actually be able to live on Mars or on, you know, on the moon and, or, or just experience the metaverse like you would experience reality, at least visually. And I was always thinking, like, this is going to happen like in 2030. I hope I'm, I hope I'm alive when these panels happen. As it turned out, um, a, a team that worked initially at Lytro and for that real, real D, um, led by my friend and, and genius um, guy, John Carafin and his team, they had a startup called Lytro Lab. Um, I was like, I immediately was like, I, I want to be an advisor. I want to help you guys get going. They've got tons of funding. I mean, Samsung, I think, and, and others invested about $28 million in them. And they just showed their first Lytro panel. And our partnership with them is all about taking renders um, you know, and, and re rendering to those panels. Like that is our ground truth for knowing whether or not light field rendering that we've been working on forever even has any meaning. And so we're starting, of course, with offline stuff. But, you know, the idea is you can also play, bass, uh, play blast light field um, animations or content or even do the equivalent of quick time object movies, right, where you can move the Starship Enterprise around, right, which is another test case for us. So the idea of these holographic display panels are very much why, for me, light fields, whether you're talking about it as a format or as a, a concept, is, is inescapable. And I, I would say that that's not just going to be for large wall size display panels. Eventually, if you have any screens, they will be light field screens. There's no doubt that that's going to become another obvious thing because why not? Like, why not have, you know, you, you, I think at CES, you just had, um, it was Acer, you know, one of the laptop companies that, that basically showed something with Domenko where you had a traditional lenticular thing, but it has eye tracking. So you see something that looks holographic. That's still really compelling. But imagine that in every, on your desk and everything else. And I feel like that is going to drive so many of the experiences we have in the metaverse. The glasses may be an alternative to that or, or parallel track, but I do think that that's one of the reasons why light fields are inescapable. And for me, I want them, something to look real and feel real and be real. I mean, you know, that's kind of like you know, the diffraction limit of light where that resolution starts to matter. That's where having something that, that is renderable at that fidelity becomes important. And of course, then it's like, well, can we make this interactive? Can you add touch? Can you make it so that it's physics, all that stuff? But, you know, those are layers that we, we can get to, you know, certainly once once all the other elements are starting to coalesce around the, you know, the graphic stack itself. But they are working on ultra haptics for touch, for example. And the first display panels were going into production this year. So, you know, people wanted one for his physical NFT to display his renders on. And I just think this is they went to the museums like the Smithsonian eventually, and then and then theme parks and, and eventually 100 inch TVs and windows and maybe entire buildings will be covered in holographic panels and cities will look totally different because you can make a building invisible or you can make it look like anything. Super interesting stuff, right? And, and that's where I kind of, I, I've always been intrigued by that. The holographic uh, display has been, since I was eight years old, something I fundamentally wanted to see happen in my lifetime. And here we are. So it's, it's, it's a big part of why the light field content pipeline has always been super important. 10 years out. Oh, I think it's. I think you're going to be able to pay for it this year if you really want one of these things in your in your you know in your uh, theme park in your in your you know for your concert. It's those those 20 inch panels. The one that they showed um, just a few months back, 
publicly at CNN. They invited the press. Those are, it's like the Samsung video wall. You just buy another 20 inch or 20, you know, and you can make it as big as you want. And the larger the holographic panel, the further in and out holographic objects can, can, can be pushed. And you can also then turn it into a wall or ceiling or floor and you can build a holiday. It's like tens of millions of dollars to do that now. And I kind of feel like you probably want to wait a generation or two when they get to scale, it becomes way cheaper, but it's going to be like OLED. It's not going to be anything fancy, fancier than that when the scale becomes, um, you know, universal. So this is the decade where I think you'll start to see that at the high end. And then in the 2030s, you'll see that in, in homes and in devices everywhere. Um, and then the capturing side of it and the content side becomes interesting too, because even if you're thinking about this as a hundred inch holographic TV, is that going to be left and right eye depth maps? No. Real time rendering? Who knows? You know, maybe, maybe the way that I, I see that working is I, I, we have this interesting metaverse ready project. Like I, I like picking something that is creatively an art project for us at Otoy to do because it helps us dog food our own ideas. I'm also, I created the company as an artist and a creator to try to get, um, you know, to, to, you know, because I wanted to make things, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a gamer and I'm an artist and I, and I love that. So my best friend, Zach created Star Trek, um, is an investor in Otoy. And, you know, one of the products that we've been doing for, for years now has been to basically archive all of the Gene Roddenberry's um, work. And, and that includes blueprints of the Enterprise and Rod Roddenberry, my, my best friend. And, 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 you know, as we were getting into you know, the last few years of this project, he's like, let's consider building like the Enterprise quiescently. They almost did that in Las Vegas in the 90s, built a life-size Enterprise you could visit as a hotel. And we've done that. Like we showed that, it actually was featured in the um, Apple um, event. You know, we were showing what you could do with a 64 gig GPU and, and this, this Enterprise model that's been put together by the people that worked on the show um, with details and the interiors and everything working. Like that's a metaverse asset. And we're at the point now where we have all the different versions of the ship. We have every single episode. Where is the ship? Where is the scene? Where is the camera? We can practically render the episodes again. We're now getting to the point where people like Spock and Kirk and stuff are renderable. And I'm thinking if we can basically figure out between AI capture and, and artistry, how to tell, you know, any episode of TV or any event ever, um, and, and we'll start with, with just, you know, the sort of meta history of the Starship Enterprise, then we've got a pretty good sense of how content and, and certainly experiences that are telling a story might work at a, at, at a meta level. And I love that, you know, that, that idea. So just getting the Starship Enterprise right to, you know, make Gene Roddenberry proud in the metaverse, if we can get that one thing, that one asset right, and figure out all the pieces that connect to it, that I think is a much, you know, more tractable proposition than building the open metaverse or, or you know, looking at the entire thing. This is something that um, we're getting so close to holographically rendering, you know, beautiful Star Trek scenes on a holographic display panel that I'm like, holy moly. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, AI is helping us actually get, you know, be able to track what actors have done on older date shots and then turn that into 3D and render it again. And it's, it's wild. Like that kind of stuff is, it's amazing. It's amazing. Fantastic. Fascinating. Uh... Joe, thank you so much. Um, Patrick, I think we're, we're going to go to two last questions, which is usually how we close that uh, those shows. First, I know we've talked about a lot of things, but any other topic that you had expect to cover and we did not cover today? I think we covered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, usually I tell people, when you listen to a podcast, you can listen at 1.25 speed so that it goes faster. I don't recommend to listen to you at 1.25 speed. <laughs> Uh, it was so much to unpack and to uh, thank you so much. Another thing, you know, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned some names, but any organizational person that you want to give a shout out to that can play or has played an important role in thinking about the open metaverse. Ari Emanuel is is my my brother from another mother. He's the CEO of Endeavor. Um, if you ever watch the show Entourage, uh, the Ari Gold character is based on him. He helped me build this company, and he's been absolutely. An amazing collaborator. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. So, I mean, he is, yeah, he is my brother from another mother. Um, and, and many others. I mean, I have an incredible team at, at, at Otoy. You have incredible advisors, too. Congratulations on your ability to. And incredible advisors, too. That is, that is correct. I mean, amazing. Just, I'm, I'm surrounded by just incredible people. Um, and, yeah, it's a team effort. Wonderful. Well, yeah. we're super lucky to have you today. So, Joel, thank you for your generosity. Yeah, thank you so much, Jules. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Mark. It was such a pleasure. I have homework to do with ITMF and GLTF because I took notes on that, and I, I want to I, I want to do some digging there. It was very intriguing, and I, 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 we're going to look into this. So, Jules, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who's listening to the podcast. We're, we're lucky to, you know, uh, the metaverse is is a trendy topic, so we have a lot of interest. We got some 
accolades and recognition. So thank you, everybody. Uh, please review. Let us know who you want to see on the show. Let us know uh, how we can make it better. Bye, everybody. Thank you.